Hi Glasgow, how you doing? I'm in Glasgow, all things going to plan, but I'm not. It's some weird DeLorean <laughs> Time Lord goodness. Uh, the most important thing is I'm sitting next to a, a really wonderful young man and fantastic singer-songwriter who I know all of you watching this are really happy to, to hear from. Ben Howard, great to see you. Hello mate. How Hi. are you man, you good? Yeah, good. Thanks for rolling past Radio 1 at a ridiculously early hour of the morning for musicians. Yeah, it's all right. I thought, I thought it was quite an early stint. And then you saw, I saw someone coming out going, oh, I've just done the morning shift. And that was at 5 o'clock in the morning. So I just I was like, okay. Yeah, broadcasting, man. It ain't, it ain't like yeah. being an artist. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? What do you like in the mornings? Are you, I mean, because you know, you, you're, you're a surfer. You, you're, you're a man for the water. And you have to go and sort of get involved in all sorts of unorthodox times to get the right waves and stuff. Yeah, I, I think I go, um, I, I think I sort of pick and choose um, which mornings I'm good on. Um, I, that Winston Churchill philosophy of just um, yeah reserving your energies. Um, so yeah, I'm mostly bad in the mornings. And then once or twice I'll be alright. He's already <laughs> quoting Winston Churchill. You know this is going to be a real party of a conversation. Mm. Um, the reason we've got you today is because um, we're, we're we're here to talk about BBC introducing and about the importance of. Um, you know, being an artist in this day and age, how important it is that we still have unique voices and unique music that's being made. Mm. But really, specifically about your story, um, you know, to get some anecdotes, to get some encouragement, to get the hard truth as well for, for, for musicians. And everyone watching this right now in Glasgow are aspiring creatives, and there are people all around the world who are watching it on, on Red Button and online. And I want to know your story. And um, I want to start right at the beginning, man. What was your mm. first and earliest musical memory, even as a child? Oh, earliest musical memory? Um, it's going to be one of these, isn't it? Um, I think it, there was a lot of, um, it's mostly records and stuff that used to be on. Um, my folks always used to put records on when I went to bed. Mm. Um, so I've got, um, I don't know, uh, James Taylor. That, mm. um, Sweet you never Baby, had a chance, did you? Sweet Baby James record, that was... Um, you never had a chance, man. Uh, you were always destined to do this. Yeah. That's what your parents were playing to you when you go to sleep? Yeah, that was, uh, that was our, like, my bedtime tunes. Amazing. And then there was, um, yeah, all, all sorts of, um, all sorts of stuff. Um, Mazzy Star was kind of quite big wow. when I was a kid. Made into you? Yeah, they had that on as a kid. And I've only just, I rediscovered her a few years ago. And what it a was voice. like, yeah, it kind of really brought me back. You know, the odd record that just brings back to childhood and stuff. Mm. I've, I've just got my parents onto Spotify now. Um, Mum hasn't quite grasped how to use it. And uh, so she puts like full albums on. You know, like she's just got like four albums. Um, and we both share it. So I, it, I can almost like critique them and go, mm. okay, right, what about trying this? Um, but every now and then she keeps just popping on the odd gem from like a, an odd Donovan song or something. Um, That's interesting um, though that, you, that you know, your mum would approach something like Spotify with the possibility of infinite playlist rearrangement and yeah. curation and treat it like it's a record store, like it's a record yeah, collection. Yeah, totally. Totally. Anything, anything new she's heard of, she's like, well, I'll just put the whole album on and yeah. like that. Just like a, yeah, it's like her iTunes. It's well, well uh, on that note, you know, being someone who has grown up in the modern age and understands that you, you have, like I said, you know, freedom to be able to rearrange music in whatever order that you want nowadays. Um, do you appreciate the fact that she looks at it as an art form based around albums and as a whole listening experience as opposed to individual songs? Yeah, I, I definitely, I, there's got to be some truth in that, isn't there? Um, I think, uh, uh, there's definitely a generational divide there where um, it was it used to be albums and now it's sort of um, music's just stuff you can just grab hold of and you mm. can just grab a track from anywhere and um, obviously online you can just stream the odd track and if you like it then you buy one song and you kind of um, I don't think you definitely don't get like less and less you have catalog artists these days I, I think that's what I really struggle with I'm always like I've always seen myself as someone who writes albums and not um, I never thought any of the songs would get played on radio, you know? Like, mm. uh, I remember when you played Old Pine, and it was like, wow, it's actually on the radio, and we've had so much radio play since then. Um, but I've always seen it as an, as an album thing, and I've always seen a sort of a big gap um, in my generation of, of people who buy records and, and sort of record artists. Um, do your friends listen to albums? Yeah, I think, um, I think most of them do. Um, we're sort of, um, I think, kind of an, an eclectic bunch down down Tottenham, so you kind of um, you have sort of all sorts. So some of them, some of them are, some of them aren't, and um, some of them have great music taste. Some of them have horrific music taste, but I think that's any sort of friendship group. Yeah, right on. You've got a couple of key figures that dictate the music that you listen to. Mm. Oh, I'm sure anybody who's watching this right now will be able to identify with that with yeah. that sort of social philosophy. Mm. Um, okay, so you know we've, we're at a point where you're listening to music as a child, and then at some point it has to make a transition into into you know a purpose for you as opposed to just a passion. Um, yeah. When when was that? Um, I don't know, maybe, uh, I think probably sort of ego kicked in when I was like 
16 and I, I played an open mic in um, in Totnes mm. and uh, yeah I played in the pub I wasn't supposed to be there and um, you nervous? I had, yeah I was terrified I had like a I had a nylon string guitar like my, an old nylon um, and I was trying to play in a pub and it was like around Christmas time when everyone comes home so it was like a really busy pub <laughs> um, everyone's sort of crowded around like right up to here no monitors Whoa. or anything and I've got an acoustic guitar trying to play through a mic that's here. This is a local and pub in your area, yeah, so everyone knows you. Yeah, everyone knows me and I'm trying to sing. Um, that was the first like open mic I did. I didn't do one for a while after that. How many songs did you play? I think I played about three. Okay, and any of them that you would even recognise today that went on to take shape in, in any kind of form later on or were they just no. very, very sort of early yeah. on? Yeah, they were pretty... Um, Pretty basic. Pretty budget, yeah. Yeah, right on. <laughs> well, I mean, that's an important first step that everybody, including everyone watching, will, will, will have to undertake at some point. Otherwise, you just remain, you know, a, a bedroom artist, someone who makes it for your own purpose. Yeah. Um, did, when did it start to feel comfortable? When did you think, okay, actually, barring that really terrifying <coughs> mic situation, I can't sort of get in the way of this. This is a, this is a drive for me. I think uh, definitely like uh, the open mics when I was at uni, I had a lot of time to kill. So mm -hmm. it was... Um, uh, I, I kind of we I spent quite a lot of time in the pub. Like I met my manager mostly in the pub, um, and that was we were just mates at, at, at college or uni, and um, uh, and it was just a place to hang out. And there's a few people playing music, and I, I liked it. You know, I got a kick out of sitting in front of people and and getting to share music. You know, mm. like I, I kind of more and more realised that the, the the great thing about music and being able to play in front of people is you get you get to share stuff that you probably don't talk about, um, and. Uh, you get uh, it's your one way of sort of being creative and getting to share that with people and um, uh, so I got a real kick off it when when I was at uni I think at the beginning I always tried to impress people like I'd try and uh, it's like a, a condition I think we're all guilty of it you, you kind of spend so much time in front of other people and mm. I think on a day-to-day -day basis we spend so much time trying to please other people and um, and wondering what they'll think um, and so I was very conscious of that I think when I was younger and I'd always I'd always play and I'd be like try and pick the most impressive songs and um, yeah it was it was kind of always always a, a battle of, of like picking the most impressive songs and then just settling into a style that I had yeah part of the mm -hmm. process of finding a voice mm, finding yeah. who you are and working out that actually less is more as long as what you're saying or what you're playing is essential yeah I, th I think it's a lot easier when people start listening to you to actually sit back on it and go okay cool I don't need to sort of shout about it I can just yeah. I can just do my thing now I want to talk to you about the you mentioned something before about being in the pub and meeting your manager becoming mm. friends with your manager <laughs> yeah now if people are watching um, you know Ben and his manager obviously are still very good friends yep and still my manager still yeah. your manager and um, He's gone on to win like Young Manager of the Year. At yeah, the, Breakthrough at Manager of the breakthrough Year. Breakthrough Manager of the Year yeah. last year. Um, and is widely considered by many in the industry to be you know, someone who's done a great job with yeah. you and with your career. Now, I think a lot of people watching this will think, I need to get management. I need to go and sit in a, in a, in a leather chair in an office and discuss mm -hmm. the, the, the ins and outs, the terms and the conditions and how my career is going to change with somebody who's wearing a suit and a tie, smoking a cigar yeah. in a high-rise building. You met your manager <laughs> in a pub. Yeah, I think that's the best way. Um, yeah, well, I've met I've met guys in um, in leather chairs with um, smoking cigarettes and uh, yeah, looking all serious and handing you loads of paperwork. Um, but I, th I think our whole thing has been like uh, the sort of gaps have filled in as we've been going. And I mean, I met I met my manager. We were in a pub. Um, I'd, I'd met him in the sea and I'd met him a couple of times before that. But like we, we'd become friends by then, and it was only when I played an open mic to about five people, and he was like, "How am I? You need a manager." I think a lot of people look at managers as being some kind of protective, you know, parental figure who can go in and make it all work for you. But really, you probably justify this. What's the most important thing? Surely it's the friendship, the chemistry and the trust. Yeah, trust is a big one. I think someone that sees the same same outcomes as you, even if it's slightly different and, and someone you can battle with, but someone you can, it's not like a strict, we've been quite lucky because it's never been a strict business thing. It's never been, um, I think you can really bash heads with someone who's, who's sort of a, a collector and a shepherder mm. um, and they sort of just go all right you're doing this you're doing this you're doing this and as a young artist you know you don't know what you, you'll follow that and if, you, if you've got if you've got bad guidance at the beginning then you're in real trouble so you started making your own records yeah we um i, th I worked with i worked in a few studios and stuff um I, I did a few things you know i worked with um other songwriters originally for for not originally like just for a bit just to see what that was like and that was horrific. Like, yeah, um, just all of a sudden, this creative process was 
you were it was like a, a junction and there was other people kind of meddling in it and it was it was quite early on and i just realized this is this is definitely not how it's going to go this is not what i do it for I, I, I do it because i love being creative and i love writing songs and i, mm. I wasn't i wasn't bothered about um it, it sort of anything after that i kind of I, I wanted to have a career in music like a career i mean it's such a weird thing to put alongside no, music i, I wanted to good. play i wanted to play music for years you know yeah um, it's called a career. <laughs> yeah, and so it was. I wanted to find the right avenue for it, and uh, as soon as those creative processes start getting stumped, then it yeah. meant that I, I wasn't enjoying myself, and I, I definitely got freaked out by that. So it was a funny time at the beginning, like um, just figuring out what I wanted to do. But then we, um, yeah, went into recording as well. I went into a few studios, and um, like I said, I'm quite stubborn, and I'm quite, I, c I can get quite, um, I'm quite determined. You know, if, if there's something I'd, I've got in my head. I, I want to at least get it out, and sometimes mm. it sounds different, and you scrap it. But like, um, so like in the studio, I'm quite difficult to deal with. Probably, I'm not always on. I don't know what the buttons do, but I'm on their shoulder, going, "No, that's wrong. Maybe try that. No, it's not that. Try that and try that." And mm. He's like, "You mean this?" And um, so I was quite fortunate that um, Chris came along, um, who plays drum. He, he was playing in a friend's band, and now he, he plays drums and bass for us. And we did a couple of demos in Leighton in London. Um, just in the winter, I was like, let's try it with a couple of dodgy mics. And, mm. and the demos were probably, if you listen to them now, they're probably atrocious, but we decided at that point that we could do an album. And you had a vibe. Yeah, and, and we, could, we had the freedom like, to, to actually do it ourselves, and I got really excited by that. I yeah. just um, thought no outside pressure, um, no sort of set studio times and stuff. It was like, we find a place, set up a, set up a home studio and do it that way. And I think Bonnie yeah. Bear was big in my mind in those days. I, uh, that was... That was when that um, forever, forever ago had just come out, and if he can do that in a forest, in the exactly. Of I listened to a lot of Iron and Wine as well, and um, I, I loved all. I loved. I love imperfections in records, and mm. I kind of thought if we can make a record that's a bit, um, um, just a bit croaky around the edges and not not perfect, then I'd be really happy with that. More happy than a polished song. Yeah. Mm. Well, let's just for people watching now. Let's let's talk about faith at this point because right now you have management. Yeah, do you yeah. believe in God? Whoa. No. Uh, you know the faith that you have in your own in your own journey because, you, like you say, you're stubborn. You've ignored the concept of co-writes. You mm. want to do your own thing. You want to see your songs out. You want to get them out of your system for better or for worse, whether anyone gets them or not. Mm. You found a collaborator, but at this point, just you know, what what are your ambitions? What are your goals? And what are you hoping to achieve here? And and do you have a feeling that this is definitely the right path for you? I think I always knew. Strange, I always knew I was going to play music, like even when I was a kid. Um, no matter what other distractions I had and what, whatever I did, I, I always knew that there was something for me in music and that, that that's where I'd go. I just, um, it's just a gut feeling, you know, you have, you have these little things in your subconscious you don't listen to, but you mm. know they're sort of there. And I always knew I'd, um, always knew I'd play music. How'd you get signed? Um, we, we sold out a couple of shows in London. How'd you do that? I don't know if people came to them. Yeah. yeah, but how do they know? I mean, you know, there'll be people who are in <laughs> bands going like, God, we play shows and there's, there's, I mean, I know you did do shows in front of five people, four people, there were yeah. those times, but still, you know, to get to a point where you're selling out shows in a city as big as London, I mean, that's a pretty amazing achievement. Yeah, I, I, did, um, I did a lot of support. Um, I, I always had, um, I, I liked keeping busy, you know, I, I liked traveling. My, mm. my huge thing was traveling as well. I liked, um, I, I got offered a couple of small European support shows and that was like, um, I was at Christmas. I was mm. so excited. And who were you playing with? Do you remember? Yeah, I played with Xavier Rudd. Um, mm -hmm. and I remember um, I turned up at a show in Rotterdam. Was the first one with him, and I'd borrowed a car, and I didn't have an address. Didn't have sat nav or anything. Um, I didn't even have a phone at the time. And you borrowed a car I'd, in Rotterdam, or you drove to Rotterdam? I drove to Rotterdam, and and I what? But I, I drove to Rotterdam, and I didn't have. All I own. had was the name of the venue. Yeah, oh, on my own, and I thought Rotterdam was really small. It was like. <laughs> It seems, yeah, there's so many of those little naive ones now. Where, what? That's crazy. Um, I was like, I'll be able to find it. And How long did it take you to get to Rotterdam? Not that long, but it took, um, it took me about three hours to find a venue. Um, <laughs> luckily, um, yeah, luckily the Dutch speak great English. And that, but I, the venue was called The Watt, which was the worst thing. Like, excuse me, where, <laughs> where is, is the, the Watt? Watt? The Watt? Yeah, no, the Watt, you know, the venue. It's a Monty Python yeah, sketch. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, but that was so exciting for me. I was traveling and I was I was free, you know, and I had a set of wheels and um, yeah, it was really liberating that and yeah. Um, and, and yeah, played a lot of supported a lot of uh, people like um, there was Angus and Julia Stone at the time as well mm -hmm. and Fink. Mm -hmm. Fink was um, kind of uh, I, I played a lot of shows with him and it was yeah, it was great to sort of sit side stage and, and watch the whole thing. I watched the whole show every night and mm. I, I really 
really enjoyed it, just a little three piece and um, just some cool little venues. And it was my first sort of glimpse of the sort of day to day of touring because I, mm. I did so many weeks with those guys. Um, uh, but then, yeah, I think off the back of that, there's some people started coming to London shows. Word of mouth. Yeah, and a few people knew us in a few places. And Did the internet play a factor at all? People like to put a lot of emphasis on the internet these days. Was it something that you used? Um, or? No, internet was something, I think, to people could figure out where we were. Um, I th uh, like, I think we, we, we used MySpace a bit, like mm -hmm. put a few of the tunes up. on My MySpace was a great one because you could put songs up that you hadn't released yet, and mm -hmm. it was, there was no pressure on it. And, it was quite. It was good. MySpace for that. was great, man. Yeah, it was MySpace great. MySpace was great. There was that magic moment when you know music seemed like it had found you know a bit of a solution at MySpace. I yeah. Think. Oh, definitely. With just like I said, just to put songs out, and you could put a demo out, and you could put it out for a day, or you could put it out for a week. And mm. if you got bored of it, then you could take it off. Or if, if you started feeling embarrassed by it, you could take it off. Mm. Um, I suppose in a way, what MySpace has been replaced by is something like BBC introducing, and it, you know, it's gone on and done its an amazing job and been hugely instrumental in helping artists and giving them a, a, a platform for their music to be to be yeah. played um, you know and and hopefully get signed and you know you went on to get signed I remember when someone mentioned that you know that that, that Island Records had signed this young singer songwriter mm. you wait to hear the music it's some amazing la 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 and I remember thinking at the time that makes real sense because Ireland has had a rich history over decades of working with singer songwriters most notably Nick Drake mm. and then I read somewhere that that perhaps played a part in why you signed to them or it was a nice part of the lineage of it or yeah, d definitely. I think um, it seemed like a cool home for me. Again, it was probably um, uh, hadn't hadn't thought about the future too much. You know, hadn't thought about the kind of bigger picture of the whole game. And I think most of the time we went into these meetings with people, we were just testing people out to see whether they'd let us do what we wanted to do and pay us. Um, and that was it. It was um, you're like pirates, aren't you? Talking yeah, pirates. Yeah, privateers just going <laughs> in, going. Can you give us money and just give us total free reign? How many people said yes? Uh, Ireland said yes. That's about much. it. Yeah, I, I mean, everyone sort of says yes, but they mean no. Yeah. You know, like you got to, that, that But Ireland actually gave you like a, a white envelope with money in it. Yeah, <laughs> and they were sort of like yes, yeah, and you believed them. Um, yeah. And and they've been they've been true to that. You know, we've been um, we've been quite lucky. I, I think we've been fortunate that we sold records, so that's given us the freedom to sort of do what we like. But obviously, jumping forward a bunch, like the EP we've just done, they mm. gave us complete freedom to like we we I did the artwork well. Me and a friend did the artwork and the, the music and everything and then mixed it and there was no, um, yeah, there was just no pressure whatsoever. I was like, we're doing this EP and they're like, okay. Brilliant. But you would have definitely carried on had you not decided to settle with any major company, any sort Yeah, of yeah, definitely. Like, we were, we were quite happy. We were sort of marching along. I was playing music and traveling. I was, um, I was totally happy. I had the, um, yeah, the wagon was rolling and um, I, was, yeah, I was pretty, um, Pretty, pretty content to just play, play the shows we were playing and play mm. slightly bigger shows. And um, I mean, album one, I, I, I didn't see us playing shows the scale of, what, uh, of yeah. that we that have. Well, yeah. let's talk about it. Um, how, you know, give everyone who's experiencing this interview right now an, an idea as to what it's been like the last 12 months for you. It's been hectic, but then it's been... Um, steady? been very steady you know I feel more grounded now than I, I have in a long time I think um, that's called job security yeah maybe maybe um, I think you, you sort of you look around I've, I've got so many friends sort of um, struggling for jobs and stuff and um, and I'm, I'm yeah I'm very blessed that we've kind of got to this stage and and, and made an impact and um, and that the sort of the, the records done what it what it has and I've got a couple of little piece of plastic or whatever to stick on the mantelpiece. Yeah, right. Can we get a look at yeah. one of those pieces of plastic, please? Can you pass me one of those little boxes if you wouldn't mind with it? Yeah. He's, he's not like he brings them with him to interviews to <laughs> show them off and to prove that fact that they're actually in the box. And I mean, you haven't even opened this box. I don't, I don't box. know if they're actually in there. It's probably two bottles of champers. Can we, can we open one? Yeah, of course you can. Yeah. He hasn't actually opened the box here. I'm sure anybody who's looking at this right now yeah, is, is a, they've you done one on me. This you don't have to be a genius to work out what's fake. in here. There's two of them. Let me give you a clue. Yeah. And oh man, this is this crazy. Is so they arrive a good sort of four weeks after the event. Yeah, uh, to be fair, I disappeared, to for, I disappeared for a little bit. Yeah, I don't blame you. There you go, and that's what. Yeah, there you go. That's the ideal situation, isn't it? I suppose. Look at that! Wow, look at that! That's pretty cool. Isn't it? Oh my god! <laughs> can I hold it? Of course you can. Yeah. Thanks, man. <laughs> oh, it's not, you know, it's not as heavy as I thought it would be. No. No, it feels right. <laughs> well weighted. <laughs> They've put a lot of effort into the weighting, but you see the attention to detail. Nice little. Nice yeah, little. Nice sort of, little cushion on yeah, the bottom. Exactly. That ain't going anywhere, is it? Yeah. Just put that there, and that's just like. Ugh. Oh. oh. <laughs> Yeah, so I've, I've, I feel pretty pretty grounded to be honest. Um, like, uh, yeah, very happy um, 
happy with everything and I'm, I'm playing a lot of music still like that's I think that's the most important thing I, as soon as we won those like we had a day in a pub and then I disappeared and mm. been um, been playing some new music with some friends and perfect you do exactly what you need to do man you went you yeah. go straight back to what's most important yeah well everyone was chatting about Emily Sande and um, I don't know Ollie Murs and um, yeah that there's, there's a whole group of people that got in the press afterwards and we just got skipped which is that was great for me I, like I like, said you won yeah yeah I feel like I, I feel like I won I stood outside and there was no paparazzi and I had both my guitars two Brit Awards um, outside a minute ago and no one cares yeah, I but love you, that. But you, <laughs> yeah, true that. But the thing is, though, you know, you are very dedicated to the craft. I'm not saying anyone else isn't, but you're very dedicated to, to one singular thing, which is the song, right? I mean, you are your whole the whole purpose of what you're trying to do is to just get the perfect song, as, or get as close to, to to that message as you can, right? Yeah, I, I want to write. I, I want to push myself musically. Like, um, yeah, definitely. I think um, uh, just to just to be able to. Be playing music, um, as sort of as sort of cliche as it sounds, but th that's kind of that's that's all I'm in it for. The I think there's certain things that that feed your ego plenty, and I kind of um, uh, yeah, I, I do buzz off. I do buzz off the other stuff. I do I do buzz off standing in front of people. For all the musicians who are listening, who are hoping to achieve you know, some of what you've achieved and go and have their own journey and have their own experiences, what are some of the key lessons? Or be it on the fly that you've learned, do you think that you can, you can end the Every Kingdom campaign and, and go, okay, you know, this is how I've grown. This is what I know now. Uh, I don't know. I'm I'm a firm believer that everyone sort of learns. You learn everything from yourself, and that's what sort of mm. creates your path on things. Um, I don't know. I've never never wanted to preach ideas at people. I, I, I don't think I, I don't think I have too many to be honest. I think the the best way to do it is. Um, uh, is, is be stubborn, you know. Just believe, believe in what um, believe in what you believe, and learn what you learn along the way, and um, mm. and and that'll take that'll take you places that I haven't been, and that other people haven't been, and or, pe or other people have been, and that's the joy of it. You could, but you you always have to learn it yourself. So um, mm. yeah, I haven't really got advice for people. I think um, uh, you see, everyone plots out their own little um, path. Don't Does they? their own thing. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. So this summer you, you're going to be out there. You're going to be headlining festivals and doing your own tour, mm -hmm. and you know you have a, a busy year of live shows ahead. But, but I know that you are kind of trying to balance that between wanting to, to get ideas down and get songs done too, not just get stuck in the every kingdom. Yeah, 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 definitely. Cycle. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a hard one. You always want to have, um, have new material. And I, th I think I'm always, I think when you, when you play music for a living, the, the, you get exposed to so much music and it kind of, uh, I'm, I'm always just in awe of so many people and, and so much music that's coming out. Like it, it, it becomes frustrating that you're like, okay, cool. Oh, well, I want to put out some new ideas. Mm. And I want to, I want to come away from this this record that is synonymous with me now. And I, I want this is what I want to do. I want to try this and mm. um, listening to so much so much music and yeah, like I say, in, in awe of so many people. Like there's a there's a John Talbot record um, called Finn, which I listened to recently, and it's like. He, the, it's a perfect record, you know, like sonically, and I never thought I'd really buzz off music in that genre. I don't even know what genre it's in, but it's like um, really buzz off that. And and then there's there's other people like the Foles just put an amazing record. Right, some, yeah, this huge. I was listening to it all the way to and fro from Ireland, and they're just these amazing little muted guitar riffs. And yeah, so a lot of work kinda, went into that record. Yeah, a lot of work. And so it's like I really buzz off that, and it. it it, it makes me want to play music, and when you've got shows, you kind mm -hmm. of you have to play, uh, you have to play the songs that, that you've got and that people want to hear. But I can't wait to start <laughs> putting out a few little tones in there. And well, Bear Island has kind of shown the way a little bit. I mean, you know, when we heard Oats in the Water, I mean, we had a pretty honest conversation about where you, you could sort of go anywhere with that, and and we mm. talked to, we talked about references like Ben Harper and even kind of Pearl Jam at their most roots rock, and oh, yeah. you know, you know, when you can really sort of stretch out with the band and and mm. push and push the you know the amplification a bit as well. Oh, definitely. I, it's, I'm, I'm excited, really excited. Um, mm. That Burr Island was cool because it was, um, it just gave us breathing space, and, and it was songs that we'd had for a little bit, and it meant we could play them live. I think that was, that's been a continuing theme is um, putting out songs so we can play them live. I'm always pushing the label to get stuff out, and there's no, um, no framework or game plan. People get so, um, so tied up in um, having a having a game plan and, and music the music industry isn't like that these days there's no no such thing as like an official launch of a single and stuff there's not like music's there and it's out there and it's like i think for an artist you want to get it out as quick as possible so you can play it like um and so you've i think especially for someone like me i've got i got a small repertoire that's in the public domain and yeah. i want to extend that you know i want to be able to 
I want to be able to play like two hours and be able to play a different two hours the next night or something something similar, but mm. chucking a few different songs in there. So it will happen. There's yeah. no question because um, you're a really, really brilliant singer songwriter and a brilliant artist. And it's been really nice to talk with you, bro. Yeah, thanks. And uh, I hope everybody who's watching this right now, and guys, go enjoyed it and got something out of it and got some good stories and uh, and stick around because um, we're going to be talking to Mike Smith as well. So thank you. He's a great industry guy who's um, been very responsible for helping fantastic careers take hold. So thank you, Ben. Nice. Take those Brits. Thanks, Andy. Get on the, get on the train. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>